we've been looking at engaging spiritual gifts for exploits. And last week, we considered four of the nine prototype gifts of the Holy Spirit. We looked at the gift of the word of knowledge, the gift of the word of wisdom, the gift of faith, and uh, prophecy. We established that there's no one in the body of Christ that is without a gift. God has given a gift to every single person. Now, whether we operate in those gifts is another issue, but we all have a gift from the Holy Spirit. And that uh, we also have to be mindful that although we have one or two gifts that we can operate in regularly, uh, pretty much the Holy Spirit can operate any gift through a believer based on the need of the hour. If there is a need that needs to be met and there is a believer there, even though that may not be the gift that you're operating consistently, the Holy Spirit can choose to operate it through you. So there's a need for openness, there's a need for sensitivity as we allow the Holy Spirit lead us. The other thing we established last week is that the gifts are not just operational in the church service like this. They are not just operational in the body of Christ when we gather together. The gifts can operate in a setting like this and should operate in a setting like this, but beyond that, the gifts are given to us to also enrich our spiritual lives. And we talked about examples, looking at those four gifts last week, of how those gifts can be at work in helping us. So today we're going to look at the remaining five gifts of the Holy Spirit and hopefully round up the series. The first gift we're looking at this morning is the gift of healing. The gift of healing. Now, as per the Great Commission in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 18, one of the things that Jesus wants all of us to be able to do for him is to pray for the sick. Jesus said, the Mark 16, 15 says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Yeah. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So part and parcel of the Great Commission is preaching the gospel to those who do not believe. But it's also demonstrating signs and wonders, including the laying of, of hands on the sick and they get their healing, demonstrating that gift of healing. So... Jesus says that if we will act, carry out those actions in faith as we go out to preach the gospel, people will receive their healing. So what it means is that the Holy Spirit can manifest this special gift through any believer so that we can bring healing to anyone of any kind of disease that they may be afflicted by. Now, the main thing I see here is in that going. Because he says, these signs shall follow those who believe. And I have seen this operationally in my life. Many times when I have been on like missions to places that I had not been to before, preaching to people that I had not met before, I find that there's an extraordinary level of faith that makes me operate in levels that I have not operated in before. And that words of Jesus that says, this sign shall follow those that believe. Because there is really no effective way to preach the gospel without the manifestations of healing and signs and wonders. There's nothing that gets people more convinced, quicker than anything, when they begin to see the power of God at work. The Apostle Paul said to the Thessalonian church, he said, we didn't come to you in enticing words of men. And the Apostle Paul is one of the most eloquent men that ever lived. But yet he recognized that the power behind the gospel was not in the eloquence with which it was delivered. He said, but we came to you in the demonstration of power and of the Holy Ghost. I think if we will obey God more in going out to the world, and you don't have to travel 
to a missions field like the example I gave, if you would recognize that everywhere that God has sent you to is a mission field, your work is a mission field, your neighborhood is a mission field, Northampton is a mission field, if you live in Northampton or wherever you live, is a mission field. And you will recognize that the people in those areas where God has sent you to, they are harvests that you need to go after. If you would walk with that sense, you will begin to see the Holy Spirit inspire you through faith to pray for people as they talk about sickness. You know, they won't just talk about sickness and you behave like you didn't hear it or something, or you tell them, go and see your GP. Once you hear of those things, faith will be stirred up in your mind to say, can I pray for you on this? And as you begin to pray, you, you yourself will see yourself growing in faith because you see the Lord begin to answer those prayers. But we need to step out in faith, believing what Jesus has told us here, that we will lay hands on the sick and they would receive their healing. This gift is not for a few. It's for as many as will go. The signs will follow them. So this is part of the demonstration of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I believe every believer can operate in this if we would only believe the words of Jesus that says the signs will follow us as we go and we obey his words to go into the world. The next gift is very related. It's the walking of miracles. As a matter of fact, the gift of faith, the gift of healing, and the walking of miracles are classed together as the power gift because almost always those three gifts would operate together. If you are going to uh, be able to pray for someone to receive their healing or for miracles to be worked, almost certainly you're the, you need the gift of faith. Your faith needs to grow to a level that is beyond your everyday sort of operational level. So those three almost always work hand in hand. Now, some of the different Bible dictionaries describe the word miracle as an intervention in the natural universe by God. So miracles are the handiwork of God. There's no one else that can do it. It says a miracle is a phenomena that transcends natural laws. You see, when miracles operate, natural laws get suspended. In fact, as a matter of fact, it's like an acceleration of the natural. What would have happened in the natural over years, God does it in seconds to minutes, as it were. It's a divine act by which God reveals himself to people. Nothing reveals God to people more than miracle. And I believe in today's world, we need God's miracle, miraculous act again more than ever before. Because if there's a generation that doubts the existence of God, there's no generation more than our generation. And it's because they've not, they've not seen these things. You know, for, for God to do something through us, to a point that it cannot be denied. There was such an example in the Bible when Peter and John, they, they, they helped uh, bring healing to the lame man by the beautiful gate. And the council of the Pharisees said that such a great thing has been done that it cannot be denied. Everyone knew the man by the gate. You know, in fact, maybe he's the one that they used to describe that area. If somebody comes newly to the town and says, I'm trying to go, can I find the beautiful gate? And they tell him, okay, take this direction, take this direction. When you get to the beautiful gate, you will see a lame man there. So it probably had become a signpost that they were using to describe. And for God to heal that kind of person, <laughs> there's, there's no greater way. They said, a miracle has occurred that cannot be denied. And we need more of those things. Several examples, the life of Jesus, the life of the apostles was full of miracles. If we study the Bible carefully from the beginning to the end, it's literally one miracle after the other. God is still a miracle-working God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That's what God's Word tells us. So if he was a miracle-working God yesterday, he's not changed his mind about working miracles. One of the things I forgot to mention about the gifts of healing is that when you look at the, 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 the way the Bible describes it, it doesn't call it the gift of healing. It calls it the gifts 
of healing, plural, the gifts of healing. And that tells me that that gift is not just one gift. It is several gifts enveloped into one. And if you've seen people who operate in those gifts, many of them, it's almost like they find it more, it's much easier for them to operate in the gifts of healing for certain kinds of conditions over others. There are people that it's almost like their specialization is in praying for people that have cancer, for them to get healed. Some people is musculoskeletal problems, like back pain and things like that. Some other people is for genetic disorders. You know, in, a man called um, Robert Lee Adon wrote a book, God's Generals. And, and if you've not read that book, I definitely recommend it for you to read. Because if there's anything that will stir up the faith in you to say, beyond the days of the Acts of Apostles, if there was a dispensation where God operated in the miraculous, it was also in the lives of these people. There's one of those generals by the name A.A. A. Allen. There are still videos of him on YouTube. In fact, I still watch one this morning to just build my faith and encourage me. A.A. A. Allen is like his specialty was in creative miracles. Creative miracles. And by creative miracles, I'm talking about body parts that were not there before, growing, or body parts that should not be there disappearing. So it's the sort of person, you know, people will, they will bring people that they were born with one leg shorter than the other. And before they leave, the other leg will grow to meet the other leg, as it were. He was that kind of person. People on wheelchair or in bed, they, they will literally bring people from hospital, in hospital bed. One of the ones I saw this morning was this guy had a tumor on his back that had paralyzed his lower limbs. They brought him there in the bed. And within a couple of minutes, A.A. A. Allen prayed for him, touched his back. People had to turn him around for him to be able to touch the back. The man was that paralyzed. The man got up from the bed and walked. Now, so when we talk about gifts of miracles, it's, it's a package. It's not just one. Sometimes people may be able to operate in certain dimensions for certain diseases, more than others, as it were. But it's, it's a package, as it were. But the most important thing is to allow the Holy Spirit use you at the time it desires. In time, you may find that the Holy Spirit is calling you to pray more for people with certain conditions than others. But the most important thing is to make a start. Remember that the Bible tells us that absolutely nothing is impossible with God. And that will include divine miracle that he may want to perform. The third gift we're looking at is the discerning of spirit. This gift is one that is really needed in the dangerous and perilous times that we now live in. You know, the first thing to notice about this gift is that it's the discerning of spirits. Again, plural. So not just one spirit but he calls it spirit with a small s. So this is not referring to the Holy Spirit. This is talking about other spirits that are there, that these gifts can help us to discern. I believe when we talk about discerning of spirits, we're primarily talking about three categories of spirits. There's demonic spirits, there's angelic spirits, there's human spirits. And I'm going to talk a little bit about them. But what these gifts help us to do is to discern when these different spirits are operational and what dimension of those spirits are operational as it were. Now, believe it or not, even though it seems to be the reality of certain continents more than others, demons still possess people, even today. Okay? Well, in some parts of the world, the demons drink coffee and tea. In other parts, they don't. Okay? But demons still possess people. As it, as it were. And one of the ways that a believer can recognize the operation of demonic spirits in people is through this gift of discerning of spirit. And people who operate in the gift will tell you of different ways in which the Holy Spirit helps them. Sometimes they say they can almost literally see the demon through the eye of the person. Just looking through, they can see. Sometimes it's just sensing in their spirit, that this is the spirit at work. Sometimes it's even smelling. 
had, they just, there's just a foul smell in the air, the most foul smell you will ever smell. And they know that there's a demonic spirit at work. Some other people, it's, they can almost feel it in themselves. There's someone that I've heard of that when they feel, begin to discern demonic spirits, it almost literally pushes them to the point of throwing up. And they know that there's a demonic spirit at work. But it doesn't matter how people come to sense it, but they know that the Holy Spirit is the one helping them to discern that there's a demonic spirit at work. And often, when God reveals that, it's because he wants to bring deliverance. Deliverance and salvation, especially if it's an unbeliever that is possessed by that spirit. Believers can sometimes, if they are trapped in their own ignorance, can sometimes also be possessed by demons. Deliverance also will be needed in such instances. Then there's God's angels. The Bible tells us that angels are also spirit beings and they minister to God's people. All across the scriptures, we see angels appearing to people at different points in time. The Virgin Mary, Daniel, the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. These were just examples of people that had angelic encounters. And in the book of Hebrews, he told them to continue to be hospitable. For without knowing, some people have entertained angels in such ways. So even in our times, God's angels still visit people. There are people that catch a revelation of angels. But the reason why it's important, because you would think that anyone that sees an angel should immediately know that it's an angel. But the reason why it's important, the Bible says that even Satan can himself de design himself, I co cover himself as an angel of light. In 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 14, this is what he tells us. He said, for such are fake apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. You know, there are at least two religions in the world today that I established on the fact that their founders saw angels. In one of them, they say it was Angel Gabriel, but you and I know it was Angel Gabriel that they saw. It was demons designing or demons transforming as angel of light. So the reason why this is important for us is to be able to know whether even what we are experiencing is an experience of the angel of God. You know, last night, my wife and I watched um, a, a, a Christian movie of this guy that had a call to ministry, but he was really, really suffering from the hold of poverty. And he reconnected with an old friend of his who was now doing well in ministry, but that one was operating by a familiar spirit. And that one had called him and told him that I'll take you to the elders, they'll give you special impartation and all of that and all of that. And that night, the Holy Spirit appeared to him in a dream, warning him that, you know, this guy is not from me. Run away from me. And you know, I thought that would be okay. And when he woke up in the morning, he said, I know it's you, Satan, that is pretending like the Holy Spirit. Now that I'm at the point of my breakthrough. And he was rebooking the Holy Spirit as well. So that was like opposites. <laughs> I, 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 events that happened there. But the point really is that not every spirit that manifests as the spirit or appears to be the spirit of God is necessarily the spirit of God. We will sometimes need discerning. And we do need that now more than ever. In um, the third spirit um, that is important to discern, and I'll give an example at the end of this, is in addition to angels and demonic spirit, we need to be also be able to discern the spirit that works in people. You know, sometimes people don't need to be possessed by a demon for a wrong spirit to operate in them, as it were. You know, the Bible says that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, somebody can be smiling at you, and at the back of it is like, I wish you were dead or something. You know, that can happen, as it were. Sometimes people are taken over by like a spirit of jealousy, a spirit of pride. You know, when you think about psychopaths and serial killers, it's not always written on their head that these people are evil. 
They just blend in normally. And that is that disguise that enables them to be able to do the job. You know, sometimes it was it, I, I can't remember, was it the police guy that was caught in London, the one that kidnapped um, a lady uh, recently, not, not more than a year ago, that like he, he, was, he, he was like an undercover cop kind of thing. By the time you started to ask the neighbors, they were like, ah, they're just like a regular family and all that. That's how people look on the outside, even those that mean evil for you. But you need the ability to be able to discern spirit. Sometimes you may not even be able to tell the exact spirit at work. All you just need to know is that there's just something not right about this person. And when you begin to sense that in your spirit, that's a signal, a red flag to you to withdraw yourself. It may be to withdraw yourself until you get further clarity as per what spirit is operational. You know, many times we get the sensings of the spirit. That, but you just look on the outside and say, ah, but, but this person is very, very nice. Ah, they are very nice. They did this. They did that. They did that. You don't know that people can, can be very good at disguising themselves. Uh, but we need the Spirit of God to help us discern. In, in Acts, there was an encounter, Acts chapter 16, verse 16 to 18, that if it wasn't for the gift of the discerning of spirit at work, no one would have guessed that this lady did not have the spirit of Christ. And many people, especially from the African continent, fall prey into all of these things. A person looks like a man of God. He said, you know, I was listening to a clip by a man of God recently, and I thought, actually, you're making a real point. He was talking about how in one of the nations of Africa that this man came from nowhere, and they classed him as a senior prophet. Nobody knows which Bible school he went to. Nobody knew, knows who his contemporaries were in the faith and all of that. At least, if you don't know anything about me, you can go back to my medical school and ask. You can go back to the fellowship I led. You know, you can, there is history to trace. But you don't know where this person got his power. He just came out of the scene and started to perform miracles. And people followed after him like sheep without shepherd and all of that. And I'm like, this is the danger when people cannot discern spirits. They just follow anybody and anyone that looks like they have the spirit of God. And ultimately are led almost to destruction. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 to 8. The Bible says, Now as it happened, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought our masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Is she right or not? She's right. They are the servants of the Most High God. They proclaim the way of salvation. And you would think that ah, only the Spirit of God will have revealed that to her. But verse 19, see what Paul did. Uh, uh, verse 18, and she did this for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, and note is a small s, so it's not the Holy Spirit. I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Okay? So everybody else was deceived that this was the Spirit of God because this lady was saying, these are men of God who proclaim the gospel to you. And you think, oh, if it aligns with what looks spiritual, it must be the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't the Holy Spirit. And in the same way, we need to be able to discern spirits at work in people, especially those ones that don't mean us well. If you are getting sort of red flags in your spirit, you're getting hesitation. You know, there, there have been friends that we just cut off relationship with when at some point we just start feeling hesitation. You want to go and visit them and you just feel the Holy Spirit putting a break, holding you back. And sometimes you make yourself go and you discover when you get there, you are not going to discuss anything they define. You are going to just discuss all the other things that will be a waste of time and almost even bordering on sinful conversations than you think to yourself. So after a while, I got the message that actually this was the Holy Spirit helping me discern that this is not an association that I want for you. It may be difficult because with like, oh, he's friends, but I've known them for these years. I've known them for that years. 
everybody comes to your life for a reason and for a season. Some will be for lifelong. Some have done their job. You need to know when to move on. Discerning of spirit, very important. Praise the Lord. Are you learning something this morning? The fourth gift, and we'll be rounding up gradually, is the gift of tongues. And the Bible calls it different kinds of tongues. Different kinds of tongues. This, this is simply the Holy Spirit giving us the supernatural ability to speak in a foreign tongue that you have no ability to speak on your own. So it may be a language that exists. So I don't, well, I'm, some people will be surprised now because I've always told them I could speak it. I don't know how to speak Spanish, okay? But, <laughs> but if the Holy Spirit was to operate through me to begin to speak Spanish to an audience that needs to hear Spanish, then that becomes the gift of tongues operational. But there's also what Paul calls angelic tongues. It's not going to be tongues that exist in any language anywhere on earth. But it's a language that exists somewhere. We can also pray in that. Either way, the important thing is that you don't understand the language that is being spoken to you. And you then ask yourself, well, if you don't understand the language, what is the benefit of the gift? The Bible tells us several reasons. One of the reasons it says is that we don't always know how to pray or what to pray for. We don't always know. How many people here, every single time you want to pray, you exactly know what to pray for and you know how to pray for it? I would really come, like to learn from you. I don't know. There are times that I find myself, even in the place of prayer, and I don't have the words to pray with. That's what the gift of diverse tongues is for. It's of all the gifts, this is one of the ones that is personally for your own enrichment, for your own spiritual development, to enhance your prayer life so that you can always pray according to God's will. So if you ever find yourself in prayer and you are not sure what to pray about, that's an opportunity to just connect in the spirit and pray in tongues because the Holy Spirit wants to be able to pray to you. The Bible says the one that prays in tongues, that he bypasses his mind. You know, your thinking is bypassed. It's your spirit connecting directly to God. And sometimes God wants to download things through your spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one that brings you to that point of sensitivity to be able to receive from the Holy Spirit. It says, we will be speaking out mysteries and only to God the Father, but the Holy Spirit will know exactly what it is that we are praying about there. In Romans 8.26, it says, likewise, the Holy Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So this is the beauty of this gift. It's given for the spiritual enlightenment of the believer. However, this is a gift also that can operate in a meeting like this that we are. God can just give somebody a message for the church in diverse tongues, and they come out and they say it. But when that such message is given in the church, in order for people to edify, another gift needs to be edified, I mean, another gift needs to be at work. And that's the final gift, which is the interpretation of tongues. Interpretation of tongues can operate in a, in a person's personal life. Maybe in your prayer time, you have just expressed a message in tongues. And the Holy Spirit gives you the interpretation of that tongue for your own edification. Or God may just give somebody a message for the church in tongues. Another person in that congregation or that same person may also have the gift of interpretation of tongues or pray through them so that the church can benefit from the message. I remember, I think it was 2014, before we started this church, my wife and I, we went to a church in Milton Keynes. Um, we, we had been told about that, that church, that 
I, I wanted to see what a diverse church was like. And I heard that there's this church in Milton Keynes that has people from about 14 or so nations there. So I, I went for their service. I just wanted to get a feel because up until then, I'd always been in an African church in court. I wanted to have a feel of what it was. And I learned so many things that day when I went there. But one of the things that I took away and <laughs> encouraged me was that towards the end of the service, somebody came and gave a message in tongues. And the pastor, or it wasn't even the pastor, it was the person, he was one of the elders that was leading the service that day, said that that was a message from God in diverse tongues. We're going to wait for God to give somebody here the interpretation. And we waited for like a minute or two, and somebody came out and interpreted that message. I was like, this is the New Testament church at work. That encouraged me greatly. But that's the way it should be, okay? So if you feel that the Holy Spirit is giving you a message for the church, whether in tongues or not, just speak to one of the leaders, uh, especially those coordinating the service. That's why there's usually someone coordinating the service each time to say, I believe the Lord is laying a message in my heart. We will make space and allowance for that. And once that message is delivered, the same spirit that gave the message would give somebody else, or that you, the same person, the interpretation for that in the church. So, and Paul is saying that tongues in the church, if it's not interpreted, does not edify anyone because you don't understand the language. But he said once a message in tongues is interpreted, it becomes the same as prophecy. Because, and so, interpretation of tongues at work is almost similar to prophecy. It's like God giving that message. And last week we talked about prophecy, and I said to you that I believe it could very well be the greatest of the nine gifts because it's given for the edification, for the comfort, and for the exhortation of the brethren. And Paul says, above all, desire to prophesy. So we've gone through these nine gifts. We've not gone through them to increase your theoretical knowledge. It's for you to be aware that you should be operating in these gifts, and the Holy Spirit could operate them through you. Some of these gifts are already resident in you. There are other gifts that the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8. Like I said, we use this nine as the prototype, but they are not the only gifts of the Spirit. He said then, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. You know, it's, it's surprising to me that even things like giving, leading, showing mercy can be gifts. There are people who are gifted to give liberally. They, they will give to a level that will shock you to your marrow. There are people that are merciful by nature. They, they just cannot but show mercy. You know, somebody like Mother Teresa, that level of compassion is almost beyond regular human level for her to just devote her life to it. There are people who have the gifts of mercy. So, these nine gifts we've talked about are just prototypes. They give us an idea of how all the other gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to us can operate through us. But the important thing is that we must seek and desire that higher level of intimacy for these gifts to be operational through us. We must obey the great commission that Jesus has given us to say, as we go, these signs follow us, especially the power gifts. Because we need them now. You see, we, we, I think we're a generation that talks too much and do very little. And that's why the world is not very convinced. Because we cannot talk more than the world, okay? They are the ones that came up with philosophy and all of those things. We cannot talk more than them. So there's no amount of eloquence that is going to make the difference. You know, there's, there's a man of God that said, a, 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 a journalist came to ask him. He said, what is this gift of knowledge and how does it work? And the Holy Spirit says, Tell him that's his shoulder problem. 
<laughs> is healed right now. <laughs> he said, that's exactly. So there's no story. There's no trying to understand. Ah, that the word of knowledge is this and this and that. Told him. He naturally would not know that he has a shoulder problem. But by telling him your shoulder problem that you've been having all these years, the Holy Spirit is healing you of it now. Not only did he demonstrate the word of knowledge, the gift of healing also followed. You know, that's end of discussion. Nothing more to say once you tell him that. And that's what we need nowadays. Not much story. It's like, look, you are saying this, the Holy Spirit just gives you a word for that person. I say, you know, can I pray for your mother that is dying of cancer? And uh, no story. <laughs> End of story. It ends there. The Holy Spirit can do that through us and is willing to do it. We just have to be ready to get to that next level. Let's bow down our heads in prayer. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, he said, stir up the gifts that is in you through the laying on of my hands. Like I said, we all have gifts. But one of the ways to stir it up is by praying in the language of the Holy Spirit. We're going to just spend a few minutes to be stirred up in our spirit that our eyes of understanding begin to be opened to that which the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. So whilst the choir just helps us in a background tone, I want everyone here who can pray in the language of the Spirit to just take a minute or two to pray, just be edified in your spirit cause that stirring to open that rivers of living water be released from your belly let joy be released here let power let giftings be released here in the name of jesus let the spirit of god saturate this atmosphere in a very strong and unique way in the name of jesus let faith be stirred up in the hearts of god's people in the name of jesus lord let that Believe that feeling of possibility, knowing that we have the spirit within us, that we have received not the spirit of this world again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba Father, in the name of Jesus. But that spirit of adoption cries out in us now, in the name of Jesus, because there to be a stirring, a release, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Oh, come in the name of Jesus. another level yeah, just just watch out for how the Holy Spirit begins to operate through you how those gifts begin to manifest like never before the word of knowledge the word of wisdom gift of prophecy the gift of faith gifts of healing working of miracles speaking in diverse tongues interpretation of tongues in the name of Jesus but we see that work in our lives. Discerning of spirits. Thank you, mighty God. For in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you just appreciate the Lord this morning?